watersheds each have a dammed lake where water begins its journey. It can be something as simple as uh, turn the taps off tightly to stop dripping taps. We're looking at the health of the organisms in the water like fish and other aquatic species. Welcome to the Sustainable Region. I'm Vanessa Timmer. Let's start by considering a few images. Snow, a llama, a piece of strawberry shortcake, and a rear view mirror. What do these things have in common? Water. In order to build, manufacture, grow, and feed most of the things in our lives, water is required. It is so essential, yet we often take for granted our reliable supply of clean potable water. Where does our water come from? And what happens when we're done with it? I'm Dachmar Timmer, and today we're going to look at the water cycle and how our uses of water feed into that loop. Water is continually evaporating from water sources such as puddles, oceans, creeks, even your fish tank. Plants also emit water vapor. All that moisture rises up, condenses, and forms clouds, and then comes back down as snow or rain. The moisture filters through the ground to collect again in rivers, lakes, and oceans, and evaporation continues the cycle. It's a closed system, so the water from millions of years ago is the same water we have today. You might have heard that our bodies are 70% water. Just think that your body water has likely spent time inside a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Today, less than 1% of the world's water is readily available for human use. Our domestic water system looks like this. Water flows through a screening and disinfection process. Then we use it in our kitchens and bathrooms, and also on our lawns, in manufacturing processes, businesses, and more. Once it goes down the drain, it flows to a treatment plant where most of the pollutants are removed. After that, it returns to nature's cycle of collection, evaporation, and precipitation. We're going to take a closer look at this system, and we'll start at the top with our drinking water. Let's go to the source and find out where our water comes from. Our tap water comes from watersheds which have creeks, rivers, rainfall, and snow melt. It collects in large lakes in the three mountainous areas surrounding Metro Vancouver. This water comes from right here, high in the North Shore Mountains. The three geographic basins are called the Capilano, Seymour and Coquitlam watersheds. They are close to public access and together they comprise 585 square kilometers. The three watersheds each have a dammed lake where water begins its journey with screening, disinfection and testing. The newest treatment facility is located below the Seymour Dam and when completed it will filter Seymour drinking water. This new facility will eliminate turbidity, reduce chlorine requirements, and ensure the water meets Canadian drinking water quality standards. I'm here above the 24 tanks where water will be filtered. Howard Dallimore is part of the project management team overseeing construction. Hi Howard. Hi. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on in the tanks? Yeah, this is a filter tank that, uh, and uh, right at the bottom of it is about 300 millimeters of sand and above the sand is 1.7 meters of anthracite. Anthracite is a type of very hard coal. And what does the anthracite do? Water moves slowly down through the filter, and as it does, any particles in the water, such as silt, organic matter, bacteria and viruses, are trapped in the filter bed. Do the filters get clogged with debris and other materials? Oh yes, they do. And about every two days, it's necessary to backwash the filter. Does that get rid of all the bacteria? Pretty much all of it. Um, say about 99.99% of the bacteria. So after the water's filtered, it flows through an ultraviolet reactor where it's exposed to ultraviolet light. An ultraviolet light has an effect on the DNA of bacteria and viruses and effectively neutralizes them. Thank you very much, Howard. Oh, you're very welcome. Play. 
Today, discover and learn in Metro Vancouver's green spaces. Discover the amazing outdoor programs available for you, your family, and your friends. Look for the Check It Out program guide at metrovancouver.org or call 604-432-6359. Welcome back to the sustainable region. Water is a precious resource. I can make wise water choices, but how do you teach that to everybody? Coming up, we'll prime you on wise water choices. As well, we'll take a look at just one way the next generation is learning. Boys and girls, that's why we have some important words here. The first one is remember to turn off the tap. Can you show me the action for off? Okay, good. Children at Nootka Elementary are learning ways to be water wise. Having this knowledge from an early age is the foundation of good water practices later in life. If we uh, say have a dripping tap at home, means we have to replace that wasted water with more water from our reservoirs. And that could mean uh, potentially if enough people are, are wasting water, uh, we would actually have to build bigger reservoirs, bigger dams. Destination Conservation is a three-year conservation education program and we work with both the school district and the school, so teachers, parents, custodians and students to help them reduce their energy and water consumption and waste production. The students actually design their own campaigns or strategies around water reduction. So it can be something as simple as uh, turn the taps off tightly to stop dripping taps. Um, sometimes they're looking for leaks so that washers can be replaced by the facilities. Other times they might look at a home program like a shower head replacement program or showering instead of bathing to save water. Stop that focus. Energy. Vancouver teacher David Epp is a participant in the Destination Conservation Program. Each time we have a workshop we share what we're doing at our schools and there's people there from different organizations that have ideas and we learn a lot more about how we can teach this. I have a song that we've added lyrics to about saving water and our class has been singing it quite a bit and at assemblies I get the whole school to sing it. The best thing about working with students and uh, getting them these messages when they're young is they're very open to it. So they haven't built up all of the, the habits that adults have. And they're very willing to adapt and change. They're also eager to improve things. So they're, they're willing to work with their teachers and their parents and their friends and their family to help them uh, tackle these issues as well and really come up with creative ways of dealing with them. So students are way better at doing that than adults are. <laughs> Sometimes we have the false impression that we have an overabundance of water here in Metro Vancouver. The reality is that in the summertime, when we're all watering our lawns and it's not raining, those reservoirs can draw down surprisingly low and we should not be wasting water. If you actually stopped your bathtub when you had a dripping bathtub tap, you'd notice you'd probably fill your bathtub a couple times during the day. If we're unnecessarily watering our lawns, that, that can really waste a lot of water, especially if we forget to turn off the tap and it runs all night and part of the next day. One thing I noticed my own kids doing, running the tap to get cold water, especially in the summertime. It takes a long time to get cold water in the summertime. A lot of water can run. What we do now, we keep a jug of cold water in the fridge, no more running the tap. So boys and girls, what's the action here? Next action, show me swimming. Swimming in water. Well, Show I hope kids have an inside. awareness that water is really valuable and it's going to become more valuable in the future. I want them to realize when they leave taps running and um, just noticing how we waste water. There are a number of ways that students can learn about water conservation and water wastage. Um, and certainly there are, there are great activities out there that teachers can bring into their classrooms, some of them provided by Metro Vancouver. The difference with us is that we really challenge them to look around in their own community, in their own spaces, and find what they can do to make a difference. And I think that helps them to see how, how a single person's change can improve the world. All we know, so let's conserve, and let it flow. Nice. <laughs> 
when it comes to pollution, every home is a waterfront property. And when it comes to how we landscape, every garden feeds our waterways. Building gardens so they soak up rainwater helps filter the water before it hits our rivers. And not using pesticides at all is good for everyone, including our fish friends. The storm drain is a direct link to your nearest waterway, and our waterways are only as good as what's in them. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region. Underneath this parking lot at Queen Elizabeth Park in Vancouver is Little Mountain Reservoir. This large pipe is in the valve chamber here. They regulate the water flowing in and out of the reservoir so that homes and businesses receive a steady and reliable water supply. A big player here is gravity. Every day, more than one billion liters of water flows through reservoirs, pumping stations and water mains. There's quite a bit of equipment used in our water system. On the supply side, we have uh, reservoirs, dams, some very large pipes taking water from those reservoirs up in the mountains down to reservoirs here in Metro Vancouver. And then from there, there's more pipes that take the water to our homes and businesses. Here are the three watershed areas north of Metro Vancouver. In general, the Coquitlam Reservoir serves the eastern municipalities, while the Seymour and Capilano water flows primarily here to the western part of the region. A large east-west transfer pipe allows water to be moved between the areas if there's high turbidity. As water flows through the system, chlorine added at the source gradually breaks down, creating the potential for bacteria to grow. To preserve the quality, the water is rechlorinated at secondary disinfection stations along the way. This is the last step in water's journey to your home or business. At this point, Metro Vancouver hands off the water to local municipalities. City of Vancouver crews are installing a municipal water main. These pipes are only eight inches in diameter, but there are a lot of them. With this final step, water flows from our taps. In recent years, an alternative choice has been bottled water, but there are hidden costs. We have a tremendous problem with the number of plastic bottles in our landfills. And some people say, well, uh, you know, I use mine over and over. Uh, the problem with that is that the chemicals uh, leach inside. The production and transportation of bottled water contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. And to produce one liter of bottled water, three liters of water are required. People all over the world would give their right arm to have the water that we have here. so tempting. The kitchen sink is right there and it's only a little grease. But before you dump it down the drain, take a look at this. Now that's just nasty. Every year the GVRD spends about $800,000 on labor and equipment just to keep our sewer system free of grease buildup. But there is an easy way you can deal with your leftover grease from cooking. Just pour it into an empty milk carton and then that can go into the garbage. You can keep the carton in the fridge until it's full. We need to think about what goes down the drain because it all ends up somewhere. And you don't want me to show you that video. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region and our look at the water cycle. Oof, dishes. Well, this is one water use I wouldn't mind seeing less of. But I digress. When water passes from here down the drain, it becomes wastewater, even though 99% of it is clean water. Tackling that 1% of pollution is important, though. In fact, it's a public health requirement under federal law. How is it done? Well, Vanessa had a chance to sniff out the answer. You can't tell by looking, but that is one stinky flow of water. This is the incoming wastewater at the Lulu Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. 
and phew, it smells in here. I'm Vanessa Timmer, and I'm here to find out what happens when we flush. Right now, I'm surrounded by slimy rakes and icky grates, gunky conveyor belts, and gigantic scrapers, all machines that are screening the big materials out of the wastewater. This is a pile of undissolved materials, such as wood, plastics, and cloth. Nice! And on the other side of this conveyor are heavier materials, such as sand, grit, and coffee grounds. These bins are filled every four days, collected from approximately 70 million liters of sewage every day. From here on in, the pollution in the water is minuscule bits of matter. The folks in this trade call it suspended solids. The next step is all about taking it easy. The wastewater flows through sedimentation tanks where there is very little movement. The result? Heavier suspended solids sink and lighter suspended solids float. Then they can be scraped away. This screening and settling is called primary treatment and it removes 50% of the suspended solids. Here is a sample of the incoming wastewater and on the right is a sample following completion of primary treatment. 50% of the suspended solids have been removed. Three of our five regional treatment plants treat the wastewater even more to further protect the receiving environment. If placed into oceans or rivers untreated, it will use the same dissolved oxygen that supports aquatic and marine life. The suspended solids use up oxygen as they break down. This is called biochemical oxygen demand. If too much oxygen is used up, the water becomes uninhabitable. Here at Lulu, the show goes on. The wastewater goes through all these funny shaped buildings and pools, and the result of that is that 95% of the suspended solids are removed. There are trillions of workers, but they're really small. You can't see them? Well, Gary Fenwick wrangles them all. Hi, Gary. Hi, Vanessa. The rumor is that your crew just sits around eating all day. Mm, yeah, I've heard that rumor too, but you really can't expect much from bacteria. That is true. So how did they work? Where are the bacteria? Well, the bacteria are in these funny shaped buildings behind us. Yeah, I see them through the fog. So what are those buildings called? They're called trickling filters. And the reason they're called that is because we spray wastewater from the top and they, the wastewater trickles through our filter media all the way down to the bottom. Filter media, kind of like this. This looks like a honeycomb. So where does the bacteria come in? Well, the bacteria live on the filter media. So they just sit there and enjoy eating and taking an air bath. That's very economical using gravity. And so yep. that's it? It goes off to the Fraser River from here? No, that's not the end. After the trickling filters, the wastewater flows into the solid contact tanks. And that's where the bacteria grow in size. And after the solid contact tanks, the wastewater flows to our, the round pools you see over there. Those are actually called clarifiers. And those three processes together is secondary wastewater treatment. To explain more about secondary treatment, I'm here with Harvey Schneider, who's the operations foreman, and Harvey's taking a sample. Where are we now? We're at a solids contact tank. Solids contact tank, that's an odd name. Where is that referring to? Well, here the uh, solids are coming in contact with our bacteria. Harvey, this is a very murky sample. Are there lots of bacteria in there? We have a lot of bacteria here. Yeah. Uh, they're hard at work uh, consuming the last of the soluble organic material and they're clumping together. And why is it so bubbly? These bacteria need oxygen to uh, survive. So the bubbling you see is where we're adding air. Uh, we're also adding the food or the secondary sludge. When we combine the two together, we call it mixed liquor. Mixed liquor, that sounds like bacteria good times. They're having a very good time in here. Uh, they're, they're eating a lot of food, they're reproducing, and they're forming uh, large particles that we call flock. And what happens to the flock? Flock, when the particles get larger, uh, become dense and they, they want to settle out. Right, so this is gravity at work here, just like what we saw in the primary treatment. Exactly. And where does it go from here once it's settling out? From here it goes into a clarifier. The flock will now settle to the bottom and then the top is where we decant the final effluent where it, where it heads to the river. In the summer months, when there's a lot of recreational use in the river, we disinfect the affluent. 
for the cranberry harvest, we've had to uh, increase the season to the end of October. We also have to remove that last remaining chlorine, so we will disinfect with uh, sodium bisulfite. Here's the final effluent. Compare that to the cloudy liquid that entered the plant. 95% of the solids have been removed. But what about the materials removed from the wastewater? They have their own story. Large materials that are screened out are taken to landfill and the sludge that is extracted is heated in tall structures called digesters. The sludge is, is dewatered, so the water component is taken out. The end product it results in a 99.99% of pathogen-free product called biosolids. Biosolids are used as a fertilizer to help plants grow. Well, biosolids are high in organic matter and plant available nutrients. So biosolids is a very important ingredient in making a landscaping soil. The majority of biosolids are used for mine reclamation in British Columbia. Biosolids are typically spread on either waste rock or mine tailings to add organic matter and nutrients to the soil. We seed the area with native grasses and that'll help establish vegetation. Here's what the landscaping soil containing biosolids looks like. Right now we're at Vancouver International Airport where the landscaping soil is being used for planting shrubs, trees and ornamental species. This is a product that's created within the region. So by recycling biosolids and using them within Metro Vancouver, it's a great way to reduce our carbon footprint and take advantage of the nutrients naturally found in biosolids. Here's where the wastewater flows out. And that's basically it for the wastewater treatment here at Lulu. To recap, I'd say that gravity, buoyancy, and bacteria are the main players. So the next time you're on the throne with nothing to read, you now have something to think about. When it comes to pollution, every home is waterfront property. When it comes to runoff, every storm drain and ditch run directly into rivers, streams, or oceans. Runoff can carry a nasty stew of chemicals, from pesticides to soap, oil, and other car droppings. Never dump toxic material into a storm drain because the storm drain is a direct link to your nearest waterway. And our waterways are only as good as what's in them. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region. I'm Vanessa Timmer. On this show, we go to great depths to explore the water cycle. And the ocean is a big, big player. Of all the water on the planet, 97% is salty ocean water. And the remaining fresh water, most of it is trapped in glaciers, in ice sheets and in mountainous areas. The water we use is a valuable resource. That's why we're examining closely how we use it and how we treat it. For our next story, we take a look at what happens after wastewater treatment. To handle our wastewater, there are five treatment plants in Metro Vancouver. Two are positioned along the ocean and three discharged to the Fraser River. At the Lulu Wastewater Treatment Plant in Richmond, a pipe which extends 200 meters is buried on the river bottom. It's two meters diameter and has diffuser openings along the top, rather like a soaker hose in a garden. Testing is done on a daily basis at the outflows of all five treatment plants. It's the information that we need to help run our facility, to run the wastewater treatment plants. The type of parameters that we're regulated on by the province are things like dissolved oxygen concentration, suspended, oxygen, suspended solid levels, and also the concentration of microbiological organisms in the discharges. Overall, the, the provincial water quality objectives at our various discharges are met. Prior to the 60s, 
what was happening is that all the raw effluent was being directly discharged to these water bodies. So if you actually look at that high point back in the 60s, you compare that to now, we're sort of dealing with the last 5%. So that kind of puts it into perspective for you. Today, Metro Vancouver also takes further steps to monitor the receiving river and ocean environments. We're looking at the health of the organisms in the water, like fish and, and other aquatic species. Uh, we're looking at the uh, bottom sediment and, and the life that lives in that bottom sediment. So we have a whole range of different testing that we do to make sure that at the point where we're discharging the water into the receiving environment, that it's not causing any problems. Beyond the dispersion areas, tests are also done in Burrard Inlet, the Strait of Georgia, and the Fraser River. We're looking at the general health of these water bodies, you know, from year to year. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it staying the same? And I'm very pleased to say that, you know, the, the norm is either that it's staying the same or it's improving. So there you have it, water, from mop top to ocean bottom. We've investigated the water cycle today and hope you enjoyed the show. Perhaps we've whetted your appetite for more. Let us know. Call us at 436-6794 or email us at sustainableregion at metrovancouver.org. For the Sustainable Region, I'm Vanessa. And I'm Dachmar. Thanks for watching.